Thank you. Freedom begins with your wallet. If you can't do what you want to with your own property, um, without someone watching every move you make, uh, recording and thank you, recording and uh, approving, then it's not really your property, is it? Um, we're going to talk about uh, anonymous digital economies and, and what it takes to make them actually work. This is uh, not just uh, about uh, digital cash because that's really not enough. Um, it's a much broader issue. Uh, when we got access to strong uh, cryptography, um, a lot of us were saying, well, now uh, this is going to keep us, uh, keep our business private from uh, the uh, bureaucratic nose. Um, but it didn't really work out that way. Um, what did we get out of it? We got anonymous email, uh, digital gold currencies, um, e-gold, gold money, e-bullion, DMT. Everybody know what DMT is? Digital Monetary Trust. Well, perhaps one of the uh, most uh, sophisticated and anonymous and successful of the digital payment systems. Anyhow, um, it didn't work out that way. None of these things have become as successful and widespread as we'd like to become a real solution because, um, well, there's nobody really cared. A lot of people don't care about privacy. And um, there are um, too specialized, too limited. These limitations. Um, well down to a couple of things. They are um, a uh, central control and um, a fee-for-service model. So, uh, what is a good model for anonymous commerce? Physical cash. What's good about it? it uh, whoa. Pardon me. The advantages to physical cash are it doesn't know who you are. It doesn't know um, where it's been. It doesn't remember where it's been. And it doesn't care how it's being used. So what if we can find some way to abstract these attributes and carry them over into the digital world? One way to do that um, gives us four attributes, some um, things that I like to think of as the earth, air, fire, and water of anonymous commerce. They are identity, value, communications, and locale. Um, the first three of these is very straightforward. Identity, um, uh, uh, public key pair, and the name string. Um, it gives us some uh, focus for um, uh, being able to establish a reputation and being able to establish ownership over stuff. Um, Value, digital bear certificates, digital gold coins, um, some way to store and transfer value. Uh, communications, uh, a way to coordinate and uh, uh, rendezvous for exchange of value. Um, but locale is special. Locale is the thing that makes uh, physical cash so such a good uh, medium for anonymous commerce. Um, it gives us a way to 
uh, a place to rendezvous. It gives us the inverse of that, which is a means to privacy. It gives us a, um, a place to store our stuff. And it gives us um, A table where we can put stuff down and pick it up and exchange it. Uh, these four things, they fit together into what we're calling the farmer's market model of anonymous commerce. This is doing business conversationally in locales. Um, Example of this, this is like, say, I want to buy some apples. I go somewhere, I know that fruit is being sold, and I say, anybody got any apples? Uh, someone says, yeah, I have apples, three quart lose a pound. Um, so I look at them, I say, those are good apples. I put down my quart lose, I pick up the apples, and I'm on my way. Um, this is... Um, Financial anarchy. There's no structure, no uh, no rules. Uh, uh, some people think that uh, financial anarchy is dangerous. I'd like to put forth what I call um, ladies' law, fine, which is security times freedom equals a constant. Security times freedom equals a constant. Um, there are ways to mitigate risks in anonymous transactions, as we'll see. And uh, I'd like to hand things over to Andre now, who's going to talk about doing business in anonymous economies. Let me know if my volume is too high or too low or whatever. Wave at me or something. Yeah? Good? All right. Excellent. Um, I want to go back and talk just a little overview here for doing business. We're talking about here a space, a new place, uh, something we're in the paper we're calling it Oz, some people have called it the free digital economy, free cyberspace, whatever name you pick. It's in effect a new territory. Um, the real issues here about doing business here, not just walling off an area in cyberspace. We do that with PGP, with SSL, with various types of encryption. We essentially are walling off a private area in cyberspace. Now, we've been able to do this for a pretty good number of years. What do we do in this free zone in cyberspace? Well, we really want to conduct business there. Business is how we survive, okay? We have to get money, we have to trade for food, whatever. This is how we survive. We want to do business in this area. Now, the real issues with doing business in this free zone that we're fencing off, our, our real issue is timing. We have now, with the internet and with encryption, the ability, that we have the situation. Consider this a new continent. That's really kind of a bad example because every time we put up some encryption, we create a tunnel or whatever we do, we're rolling off a little mini kiosk in cyberspace. It's essentially we're creating our own little private turf. And we create it and then we dissolve it, then we create it and dissolve it. So the new continent is not really a good example, but it's about as close as I can give you right now. So what really the issue is, is timing. When you have a new territory of whatever sort, there are different waves of people that come in. Um, the American frontier is one of the most recent, so it's probably a good one to, to use it as an example. But the first guys there are scouts, traders, you know, kind of wild mountain men who go in and search out the new territory. Then we bring in uh, farmers uh, who dare to come in and fence off some territory and begin to use it. Then we have all the businesses that come in to supply the farmers with fence posts and wire and uh, markets for selling their goods and make ways of moving their goods in and out. So this is developing also in that, in that basic pattern. And the end that I'm going to get to is that I think we're in a really good position right now that a lot of the initial work has been done and we're beginning to at least approach 
something of a critical mass. When there are enough people that are willing to fence off areas and do business there, once you reach a critical mass, more people keep coming because there are advantages to doing business this way towards living this way. Now, about the time that John Perry Barlow put out his Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, there were a bunch of people, myself among them, who began to theorize, what would cyberspace be like? How could we make this a real world? How would it work? And actually spent time uh, working on these models and see how they would work. Um, and it's been very interesting. There's a whole discipline called property rights theory. I won't go into it now. Uh, but it essentially predicts how this happens, and it has really been very interesting to watch. Um, some of the first people that came in began fencing off areas in cyberspace and using them for what I jokingly call the freedom wackos, myself being one of them. And these are people who used to be called crypto anarchists. Now, generally, they call themselves uh, free market anarchists but people who really believed in basic freedom that all coercion is immoral. So these were some of the first people there. And then there were the sci-fi guys who read Diamond Age and some of these other books and said, oh, I want to build something that looks kind of like that. Oh my god, we can maybe do this. Um, also, very interestingly, there were a bunch of religious people, fewer, but a fair amount of them. Turns out, there are different contradictory things in the Bible. One part in Romans more or less justifies government and rulership. The other part in the Gospels basically says that all governments belong to Satan. And there are, and there are religious people who hold to that one more than the one in Romans and who essentially say we ought to obey God rather than men all the way. And these were some of the first people also to come into this free zone. And cared, these were people who really cared about it for non-monetary reasons. Um, then we had the gambling and porn people come in who wanted a certain measure of anonymity, wanted to fence off their area and not get in trouble for what they were doing. Some of them were kind of ugly people, but that's the way it goes. Um, we had scammers who came in because it's an easy way to move assets in and out. If it's a private area, it's like a black hole to move money in and out of. So we did have a few of those bastards there too. Um, the offshore finance people uh, wanted to come in and use these type of areas because they're making money somewhere else and they don't want the tax thug in their place to know. So we have these people coming and going out of free cyberspace. It's a real strange mix. And only recently have businesses really begun to make money. I know one in particular, it's in the footnotes of our paper, Metropipe. They run a, um, a tunneler. They have a virtual private network from your machine to theirs, I believe it's SSH, and then a proxy from there out into the internet. And it's essentially a privacy service, and they keep no logs and all that good stuff. Um, they don't uh, check your IP address, it all works off embedded encryption, which is beyond me, but I understand what they're doing. So, but they're actually making money. So there are people that are now businesses that are there that are starting to make money. I believe, and I could be mistaken, but I think Hushmail has been making money for, for a period of time. Um, there have been other email services that have yet to uh, mail vault, which is terrific for uh, PGP ease of use. You can, your grandma can run PGP with Mail Vault. Um, but they have yet to make money out of it. I think Hushmail is actually making money. I could be wrong. Okay, the issue here is that we're kind of coming close to something that resembles critical mass. Is the timing right? I think so. Who can tell? It's very hard to know exactly when the critical moment is. But somebody is making money here. The guys at Metropipe are making a living doing this. I believe the guys at Hushmail are making a living doing this. So there is something going on, and at some point, it becomes a critical mass, and there's a room for lots and lots of people to make a lot of money in this. Because it's not really just a separate little area to do a little secret things. It's a whole separate civilization when you get all done with it. So it's a very interesting, very interesting thing. I'm not, I'm interested in this from, from the philosophical uh, standpoint. I'm not a code. If I write a batch file that works, I'm, I'm having a very happy day. 
Okay, I don't do that type of stuff. But I'm interested in this from a different standpoint. So another thing that was missing and not making this available, and I'm doing, am I doing okay on time? Okay. <laughs> that means I'm not, but okay. Um, one of the other elements that was missing, and we actually mentioned this in our paper a little bit, is a philosophy. Um, all of you who do this type of stuff, you understand that it's hard sometimes to explain why you do this and, and why it's important to people who have no experience in understanding. Say, you know, you're hacking, you're doing something, you know, something wrong with you. It's hard to explain because we're actually coming from a different philosophical base than most of those people. And what you do seems to them to be odd and maybe wrong or maybe something bad about it. And there's some hackers who are assholes too, but <laughs> there are. Um, you know, there's bad guys in every group. Um, but really what was necessary for this is a new philosophy, a new way of looking at the world, because essentially we're creating a new type of world. Um, and this, there's a book that we, you can see it in the footnotes, that really, in my opinion, sets the new philosophy. Uh, it's called The Lodging of Wayfaring Men. It's available. Um, Sean Hastings has put it up on his site. He wrote a preface to a, an electronic edition and put, placed it up on his site. Highly recommended because it really, if this book is right, and I think it is, it says that the philosophy of our world is not only morally defensive, it's morally superior. So it's a really interesting read. Um, I'm, I'm running late, aren't I? Okay, all right, I'll, I'll stop for now. Um, I'm going to say a few things about trust and reputation before, because it's such a um, it's such a central issue for anonymous economics. Um, without reputation, there can't be any trust. Without trust, there can't be any commerce, and this applies to both um, anonymous commerce and also to uh, uh, to business in the world of transparent banks and know your customer and coercive governments. What we refer to in our paper is the dark side. Um, To have an effective reputation management system, you need really three things. Um, you need uh, some convenient, easy way to input reputation information to the system. Uh, in our example software, uh, that can be done like with a click or two. Uh, you need uh, a easy, convenient way to be able to um, query the reputation of some other NIM in the system, and also that can be done with a click or two. Um, finally, you need uh, to have a useful unit of measurement for trust, um, not just an abstract relative uh, number without units. It needs to be something that you can, uh, something that you can use. Um, the unit that we chose was the probability that the subject will perform as agreed per gold gram at risk or dollar or whatever a unit. We chose gold grams because it's so easy to normalize other currencies and transactions to gold. Um, so uh, let's say I believe um, you would rip me off for a gold kilogram. There's no doubt about it. The probability is 1.0 that you will rip me off for a gold kilogram. So um, by that measure, it's a uh, probability of 0 0.001 that you would rip me off for a gram. So my trust for you in this system is 0.999. Um, this is not a silly number. It's a useful number. You can take this number and plug it into a simple equation and come up with a value for um, how much collateral I need to require from you for a loan or how much bond for some activity or, um, or whatever. And um, this is the same system that insurance companies use to plug in accident statistics and come up with your insurance premium. So 
um, it's it's um, it's a meaningful number. If if you can express trust as a number, then some other properties of number can be applied to it. Um, you know, the high school math stuff, distributive, commutative, associative, and all of that. Um, perhaps the most useful um, one of these things is, the, is that distributive principle. So, you can distribute risk in a transaction. You can distribute it over NIMS. You can distribute it over transactions. You can distribute it over time. Um, and in this way, reduce the risk in a transaction. For example, let's say I want to exchange um, $1,000 for quat lose. And I don't know you. You don't know me. I don't know where you live. I don't know your real name. How can I do business with you safely without taking, you know, without getting ripped off? Um, so, in this scenario, at least it's worth a dollar to me just to find out if I can trust you or not. So we have a dollar's worth of trust available. We can pass this dollar's worth of trust back and forth um, by conducting our transaction a dollar at a time. Um, a thousand uh, mini transactions and a few milliseconds later, we've managed to transact a substantial sum of money without uh, risking any more than a dollar at a time. Um, sometimes these things break down. Um, trust, I mean, fairness is a subjective uh, judgment. Uh, there are bad people in the world, and sometimes these uh, tricks will, will break down. And then we need some way to, uh, some way, some way to get justice. Uh, and justice in an anonymous world is every bit as difficult as trust in an anonymous world. Um, and Andre's going to talk about that because that's his special uh, specialty. Okay. Earlier I mentioned the fact that when you really develop areas like this, when they really develop, it ends up being not so much a little area to do something, but a different civilization, actually. Um, people have talked about this for a long time. Actually, you know, various... Um, Radicals and free thinkers have talked about this since the beginning of the agricultural revolution when theft and rulership became paying gigs. Um, but the stumbling block to a lot of their libertarian theorists and the new nation people was justice. Justice is a very important commodity and it's a very difficult one to supply. The usual models of justice require the strong man standing in the town square holding the biggest sword. And he's the one who ensures justice. If you cheat somebody, he can come to the strong man with the sword and make you pay. That's a, you know, that's very simplified, but that really is the modern model of justice. The sovereign with the sword who can make the, everyone else obey. It also turns everybody into something of a serf because no one can fight the strong man with the sword. In any event, the cyberspace model is different. There is no physical force. There's no physical force possible. And there's no way to centralize force in one hand. It just really can't work. So you have to come up with a different model of justice that will actually work in this environment. Um, several years ago, I think it was 99, uh, several of us in the old, <laughs> the old laissez-faire city project Rest in peace. Um, we began working on this, arrogantly, admittedly, uh, but we determined to try to figure out a model where this could work. Uh, we researched things like the old common law. At the beginning of the common law, there really wasn't centralized force. There was force, but not centralized. So it was an interesting model. Plus, the common law is really an ex exceptional piece of law. 
it's better than civil law. It's better than most uh, modern um, positive law. That's another story. We also looked at something that existed in the late Middle Ages called the Lex Mercatoria, or the law merchant. I won't bore you with the details, but it was essentially a form of justice among merchants that there was no physical force involved, and it worked exceptionally well. If a guy was a bad merchant, no one took him and threw him in jail, but he couldn't be a merchant anymore either because no one would do business with him. And he went quickly out of business and lost a lot of money. As a result, they pretty much were good boys and played by the rules. And it worked really well. The, uh, there are other examples um, of Irish law and Icelandic law at various times, um, but those involved a great deal of force at times, and I really didn't like them as models. The other one is Jewish law, because this was groups of people who had no physical force really to use. And not only that, but they were living in really difficult circumstances, most of the time as outcasts or semi-outcasts, or at least not the chosen, you know, preferred people. Um, so they have, and plus it has a rich history of all this stuff. It's a lot of religion mixed in. You have to separate it out carefully. But it was a really interesting group of circumstances and ideas. In the end of this, we came up with a model that involved two basic, th two basic things. One is protection before the transaction, and one is addressing grievances after the transaction. Before it, we have the ideas of escrows, of bondsmen, of reputation management, of reputation checking, and it all gets, we can, in the paper we go into it in a lot greater depth. Um, there's webs of interaction of distributed trust, distributed bonding, distributed liability. Um, it's very, it, it works really interestingly. Um, and on the back side, there's, first of all, alternative dispute resolution, which is used in a whole lot of places now already. Um, arbitration, mediation, those type of things with a trusted arbitrator. And the other is enforcement. In enforcement, it turns out that we looked at, at three particular things. One is a damage to reputation. Two is ostracism. And ostracism is really more potent than you think it is, because ostracism essentially is outlawed now. We call it discrimination. Now, there's, there is real discrimination, people who are pricks, but I'm not talking about that. Um, ostracism, if you're a bad actor, I say, hey, this guy is a bad, I suggest everybody ostracize him. Here's what happened, he did this. If you can't do business, you're suffering a hell of a big hurt. Okay, so it's a, it turns out to be a very effective mechanism. And the other final one is outlawry, which is, an, which is a strange old term. In the old days, it meant if you're declared an outlaw, essentially the justice system of that day and time, whatever it was, said, whoever screws with Joe the bastard, we won't hold him liable. Okay, so if he, Joe's declared an outlaw, he's a jerk, he's done bad things, and if you go into Joe's place and steal his horse and whatever else, you won't get in trouble for theft. Now, obviously, this is, this is the type of mechanism <laughs> you have to use pretty carefully with limits and provisos and all that stuff, but it actually does work as a model. Okay. Um, I won't go into detail. There, this model also applies to physical space, to, you know, to physical re transactions, to physical uh, enforcement of things, but that's a totally different thing and it's more complicated and I don't want to get into it. When we're talking about cyberspace, we don't have to. We're talking about commercial transactions in cyberspace. We don't have to deal with with policemen and security guards and all that. We don't have to do that, and it's very convenient. This is much easier and much better. Now, the great thing about this is that we tried it, and it worked. We had a community of a few hundred people. Uh, granted, they were probably less bastards in this community per capita than in the general community at large, but we had our share of them. Um, and we didn't plan on doing this right away. I had theorized it, some of my friends had helped me theorize it, but we didn't realize we'd have to put it into action so damn soon. Um, but we did. And 
there were a number of things that happened, a number of disputes, a number of problems, and it turns out that it worked really, really well. It actually faced what was probably the worst challenge. There was a little private community uh, doing commerce. It was essentially the type of thing we're talking about, it was, but it was a community, not individualized little kiosks. And the guy who owned the community turned out to be one of the least moral guys around. He also happened to own everything and have more money than anybody else. Okay? So in all the, you know, when you make a model like this, people say, well, what if? And what if this? And what if this? And what if this? Well, he really fit almost all of the big what ifs. Okay? He had more money, more power. He had more programmers working for him. He had, you know, than anyone else. We filed, we saw what he did. Um, I was considered a, a I, that I had a reputation for honesty. I went, I investigated, I went in, I filed reports of what happened, what he did, exactly what I saw, here's the evidence. We ostracized this guy. He had to leave town. And he was the most powerful guy in town. So this really does work. Now, does my model with two or three hundred people translate to two or three million? Probably, I think it does. Maybe I'm arrogant, maybe it won't. But I think it does, and we really did try it, and it worked better than we thought it would. So, you know, we don't have enough data to say categorically this is the wave of the future, this will work. But the first batch of data looks pretty damn good. Okay. How are we doing on time? Five. Oh, I've got, I got time. Okay, good. Um, in this model, justice is pay per use. Okay, you pay when you need an arbiter, when you need a mediator. We had a lot of commercial disputes, mediations, arbitrations, and every single one of them resolved moderately well to excellently well. And people, when there was a published report that this is what happened, people fell in line. If they didn't, people said very bad things about them. They accused them of undermining the whole community and the safety of everybody, which was true, and brought them very quickly into line. Um, it's interesting that this is pay per use. In other words, when you need an arbitrator, you hire him. The, you don't have to, as in the traditional system. One of the arguments they say, oh, well, this won't work. I say, as compared, this isn't perfect. No, it's not perfect. There are things that could happen wrong, but as compared to what? In the traditional justice system, it's full of problems. And the state who is supposed to be enforcing and creating this justice system for you, first of all, takes a hell of a lot of your money by force, and you have to pay $200 to a lawyer anyway when it comes time. Okay? So it really is financially, this model is much, much, much better. The problem is that the state won't leave you alone, but that's another, that's another story. Um, but it works out exceptionally well. One of the things we had to do is we had to build this as we went. Um, there was theory, we had talked about it, we had plans in place, but when it actually came time to do it, we hadn't expect problems to pop up that fast. But the truth is, any time you do business, a couple hundred people, people misunderstand. People don't understand the agreements, people are unhappy, this guy was late, he says, well, I was sick, I couldn't help it, you know, there's all sorts of things, and you need resolutions to problems. So we had to build it as we go. Um, I want to just tell a couple things about what exists in this realm now. Uh, first, there was a series of articles that were done, Justice Without Force. They're kind of old, um, slightly dated, but, I mean, I'm biased. I wrote them. I thought they were pretty good. <laughs> okay. Um, the other thing that was done is we, we built a document that is, is called the Common Economic Protocols, a shameless ripoff from the Diamond Age. Um, but it's a, the set of common law principles. It's, a, I think, it's 27 basic principles. And this says what justice is. What is just, what is fair. And this was taken from some of the very best legal texts, some of the very best legal minds, from the old common law. We have 
as a, an appendix to this, I forget how many, couple hundred maxims of law from the old common law that have been slightly edited to be applicable in a realm where there is no centralized force. So we have this document. It's up. There's a link to it um, in our paper. Two. Okay. There's a link to it in the paper. And the last thing I want to add, it's very interesting. I get around to conferences sometimes. As I say, I'm, I'm not a programmer. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a theorist. I'm a, you know, a, a guesser at, at what might be good in the future. Um, very interestingly, there are more academics than you would guess who think this is very interesting and a good idea. There are professors of law. There are professors of economics. There's associations of economists who are very warm to ideas like this and who are very interested. There are a couple young economists that are doing a lot of work along this line. So this is not just for you know the freedom wackos like me that we started. A lot of academics are interested in this. And actually, there are several books have been written by professors of law departments about this basic type of thing. So it's really a, a fascinating field. It's really interesting. And if I'm correct, then it's really an interesting development right now that could be very profitable for a lot of people. Once this basic thing is formed, our farmer's model market, our basic mechanisms for trading cash, there's a lot of room for really interesting products and really valuable businesses. I'll hand it back off. Um, last month, I uh, threw together a GUI that creates an environment much like what we're, we're talking about here. It's, um, it's concerned with what your uh, granny sees when she goes to buy a Ming vase online, and not so much with what goes on underneath the hood. Um, there's no encryption, no authentication. Um, it's just uh, um, an experiment in, in how to conduct business in an anonymous environment. Um, unfortunately, for some reason, we couldn't get it loaded on Andre's uh, Linux box. <laughs> but, uh, no, you don't get viruses. Um, but uh, I can show a few high, uh, high points of it here. Um, I hope. Um, so these things are, these icons, these are locales. They represent uh, places that can be identified by their name only. Um, and uh, um, there are places where you can keep coins, where you can meet people, where you can buy and sell stuff. Um, these items, these are identities. They represent, these are NIMS. These two are NIMS I created. This one is one that I copied from Andre so that when I meet him online, I can verify that, it, compare the two and actually verify it's actually him. Um, let's say um, I wanted to uh, um, sell those uh, US dollars for quat lose like I was talking about before. I would go to, for all, let's see, first of all, I would um, switch to the identity that I'm familiar with here and that has a reputation in currency exchange. And uh, I'll drop that on this locale. And this is a place where normally we'd see other people. Right now, I'm the only person here. Um, but I can pop a talk window. And now whatever I say there will be seen by other people. So I can say something like, mm. so who has spot lose for dollars? And then someone else would come back, and I would see their window pop up and say, mm, I've got uh, quat lose, and I'll sell them for um, you know a thousand. A uh, thousand dollars for uh, eleven hundred quat lose or whatever, and um, at that point, 
Here is a locale where I keep my US dollar coins. And I can just move those over. And when I do that, he'll see them. Uh, he's, he's there, presumably. We don't have anybody there right now. Um, this USD locale and the garbage I put after it is um, um, a place nobody else knows the name of, so nobody else can go there and pick up my coins. But um, I can move my coins over here, and whoever, will, uh, whoever I'm dealing with can pick them up. Uh, if I say, uh, gee, I don't know this guy, Andre, I could uh, check his reputation like this. And this sent a message to a reputation server that I'm also running here. And uh, that came back with a record of stuff about how many transactions he's done, um, the ones that people thought were successful and the ones people are griping about, and the number he sent that were good or bad, and so forth. Um, I can look at that and say, mm, uh, I sort of, I guess I can trust this guy. <laughs> so, um, otherwise, I would have to use some kind of escrow arrangement, for example. Um, and uh, in, in this environment, this is very primitive. Uh, obviously, if he was a bad guy, he could just pick up my US dollar coins and run, and there wouldn't be anything I could do about it except file a negative reputation report about him. But as it is, if I'm happy uh, with the exchange, I can file a reputation report for him very easily here that says, mm, one, two, three, four hundred dollars worth, and I'm happy with it. And this went into uh, the reputation server, and now if I go back and look at that, if I go back and look at that, I might be able to see that it's already been done. Not quite. Um, so, uh, this is the beginning of a conversational way to conduct business in an anonymous world. Um, it has the elements of, of uh, reputation management and it has uh, uh, the, the elements of being able to exchange coins in an anonymous way. Uh, the thing about this, though, anyone can define a currency of their own. Uh, the question is, like any kind of currency, what's it worth? Will someone else believe in it or not? Um, uh, a coin is a promise to pay. It's almost a contract. So uh, if someone believes that they can redeem my coin for whatever it says it's good for, a US dollar, a gold gram, um, then it's good money. If nobody knows me, if I don't have a reputation, then it's not good money. Um, let's say I want to sell my car, or well, let's say I want to sell this Ming vase. So I could take my Ming vase by, well, the used store at place that has a presence in Oz. And I can give him my Ming vase, and he will make up a coin for, he will make up a Ming vase coin for me, and he will give it to me. And now he's got the vase, I've got the coin. If I sell you that coin, it's, there's an implicit promise that you can take that coin back to the used store place and redeem it for a vase. Okay, so this is how um, uh, physical assets can enter the system and become um, a medium of exchange like gold grams or US dollars. This is a very broad topic, this business of, of, of a practical anonymous economic system. And we've only been able to touch on the um, high points of it here. Um, uh, if you're interested or you're still hungry, read um, our paper. There's 45 pages of it. And we're talking about this stuff in a whole lot more detail and maybe a little bit more coherently. Um, 
Yeah. Um, some of the ideas we've talked about here are original. Uh, many of them are not, and, and I have to apologize for not uh, drawing a very great distinction between the original stuff and the not so original stuff. Um, but we'd like, if you leave here with nothing else, we'd like for you to leave here with three basic ideas. Um, one of them is that it is possible to construct an anonymous economy um, that uh, is based on, on practical techniques to create and manage trust. Um, the other, uh, second thing is the inadequacy of uh, having just a collection of anonymous online services um, and the value of a decentralized peer-to-peer environment that creates the infrastructure for such services uh, without constraining their form. Um, and the third thing we'd like to you to, to take out of here is that there is uh, an, the advantages to having, um, to using an unstructured conversational mode of transactions like you would when you go to a flea market or um, you, you go to the drugstore or whatever. Um, that imitates the way that physical cash is used and is based on the concept of locales. Um, that's, uh, that's a wrap. Um, so I, I want to conclude just with a couple quick things. First of all, in, on, in the paper, which is on the disk, is it not? Is that paper available? Yeah. Okay. In the paper, at the end of it, uh, in the footnotes, there's one service that is mentioned, privacy.li. That was an error to put that in there. Privacy.li has a pretty bad reputation among some people whose opinion I trust. So I, I don't know, I can't give you fact that they're bad guys, but people who I know say so. So <laughs> I recommend not going to privacy.li. Um, the other thing is, if you guys, anyone is interested in pursuing this, really in my happy dreams, I see people building this, a, this basic community infrastructure that we're talking about, almost on a Linux model, where people contributing, people getting reputation capital in, in, in return for doing good work on this stuff. Um, if anyone's interested in that, Wavy has agreed to at least keep track of the names and possibly do more with them. But he'll at least keep track of the names. And we have uh, the company I mentioned earlier, Metropipe. They have agreed to give a server space if we need it. So anyone who's interested and in, really interested in this stuff, send him an email. And we're not promising anything, but we'll try to you know, keep everybody happy. Wavyhill at mailvault.com, just the way it sounds. Um, so, you know, thanks for coming, and I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I work on this stuff a lot, and this is really interesting stuff. This is stuff you brag to your grandchildren about. Son, I did that, and believe me, I know a lot of old people. It's really nice to be happily smug when you're an old guy. Thanks, guys. Um, we'll entertain some questions if they're bored. Good question. The question is, what if you got a guy who has a bad reputation, how do you prevent him from re-entering with a new NIM? And the answer is you can't. Um, but he enters in with a new NIM as zero, and it turns out we had this exact problem. And there were, <laughs> there were guys who after two or three notes posted by the new NIM, they said, hey, he's so-and-so. You know, and they said, and they said, oh, are you, you know, are you sure? And there were guys like, oh, I know this is the guy. And he went and he analyzed their language and saw which words he misspelled, and <laughs> the same words from nim to nim that he misspelled. And it really turned out not to be as bad a problem as you might think it would be. Although there is certainly risk involved with it. And that's just part of the game. You know, life has risk. And we're giving up, you know, in this model, a lot of bad things that we don't like, politics, for instance, doesn't exist. It's all, it's all commerce. There are no involuntary transactions. 
You only do what you agree to do. No one forces anybody to do anything. Now, if you think about the implications of that, that's a really big deal. So it's kind of a fair trade. Um, there's another half of that answer, too, and that is that um, no one will do business with you for any substantial sum of money unless you have a reputation. And if you keep switching NIMS, um, your NIM has no chance to build up a reputation. So you're nobody. No, uh, people will not trust nobody, not with any substantial amount of money. Yeah, the, the question is, what if somebody gives you a bad, a, files a bad credit report on you, essentially, and it's not fair and it's not right? Yes, you, there are several things you could do. One is, you would be allowed, just as in a regular credit reporting agency, to post a note to saying, you know, Joe Jones is a, is a prick and he filed this on me and it's not right. And also you could get an arbiter to come in and analyze it for you and post an opinion and saying, this was posted, but I reviewed the facts, and in my opinion, Joe Jones is wrong, and Mike should not be considered to have this, even though it shows in the record I want you to know. Um, yeah. Another half of that answer is that if you enter a million bad reputation reports on somebody, it's going to show up right here. Okay? Bad scent, or something like it. It's a moral equivalent. So, um, it's going to be uh, obvious that, that you make a habit out of sending bad reports about people. Or, you know, it's a little harder to identify the person who sets, if you're a crook, who sets you up with a lot of good reputation reports. Um, this is a primitive system. A better system would tell you a lot about uh, uh, a lot more, you'd be able to find out a lot more detail about um, the reputation reports that are being filed by who and what kind. And um, Read the paper. There's a lot of possibilities about how a reputation system can be set up. Okay. The question is, what about DMT and, and talk a little bit about its problems? DMT, Digital Monetary Trust, uh, the brainchild of, among others, Orl and Gravy. He's not the only one, but he's one of, one of the main guys. A Digital Monetary Trust, from a software standpoint and from a crypto standpoint, as far as I understand it, is excellent. In terms of the basic machinery of operation, it's super. DMT has had a real problem dealing with customers and dealing with risk in the traditional economy. Um, a lot of the, some a wise man said, the guys who build a system like this shouldn't be in charge of running a system like this. And that was really the problem with DMT. They still exist, um, but they had problems. Uh, their customer service sucked, and that's putting it mildly. They just, they didn't answer people, they were rude, they, you know, it just, they did not pull it off well. Um, they also ran into trouble interfacing with the banking system. Um, nothing that they really did wrong. They have not, you know, they're, they're not scammers. They're not, you know, they're basically honest guys. They just, the, they didn't do well running the business. It still exists and it may continue to exist for a while, but, you know, they have problems dealing with customers. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anything else? Anybody else? Going once? Going twice? Thank you. <laughs>